Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I think it's 12 o'clock, so I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming. This is a session about predatory publishing. What you don't know can hurt you. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself and then I'll let Tammy introduce herself. Uh, my name is Ruth Buter. I am a librarian here at Himmelfarb. Um, I'm the serials librarian, so I get to manage all of our journal collections. Um, and I started working here at GW in the summer of 2015 as a reference librarian working part-time and then the serials position opened up and I managed to join full-time and um, I've been working with our journals ever since. So um, I've worked in academic libraries both in uh, four-year universities and community college environments. Um, I have experience with collection development, instruction, electronic services management, reference, um, staff supervision. Uh, in my current role as serials librarian, I manage our electronic journal collection, as I said earlier, and I um, ensure that predatory journals are not included in our journal collection. Um, and I regular, regularly investigate uh, the legitimacy of journals that some of our faculty are solicited by. In fact, I just had an email this morning from a nursing faculty member um, asking my opinion on a journal. So, um, and I'll let Tammy introduce herself. Um, hi, my name is Tammy Ritzma. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Physician Assistant Studies here at GW. I think I might have gotten invited to this because I'm the um, master teacher classmate of a librarian. Um, <laughs> um, I've been uh, I've been working in research since 1993 when I graduated from the University of Michigan School of Public Health and was hired by the Michigan Department of Family Medicine to help their junior faculty get started in research. And um, uh, since that time, I've graduated from PA School at Emory University School of Medicine, and I'm a PhD candidate in health workforce policy at the University of Nebraska, where I used to be on faculty as well. Um, but I have a real strong interest in faculty development and faculty mentorship as, it re as regards um, both research and just other types of scholarly writing. And so my experience with this comes um, from uh, those, those attempts to mentor people into a new skill within their faculty um, skill set. All right. Great. Um, so we just have some slides to go through, and um, we're going to kind of be tag teaming. The, the presentation, so Tammy's going to talk, I'm going to talk a lot about what predatory publishing is and some red flags that you can look for, um, and then Tammy is going to talk about her experience uh, being solicited by predatory publishers as both an author and uh, to be on the editorial board, um, and she'll kind of give more of the author point of view, and I'll give the librarian point of view. So, um, and if anyone has any questions, um, do you want to save this to the end, or? doesn't matter to me. Okay. So if you have questions, go ahead and speak up. We do have someone monitoring the uh, WebEx chat. So uh, if we have any WebEx folks, feel free to uh, chat your questions and we can get those answered. So without further ado, we will just launch into it. And now the keyboard just doesn't work. Okay. So um, I'm just going to start off by explaining a little bit about what predatory publishing is because a lot of people I don't actually know that it exists. I didn't actually know that predatory publishing was a thing until about maybe a year, year and a half ago. So um, predatory publishing is basically an unintended consequence of the open access movement. Uh, when the open access movement came along, it really changed the business model that journals operate on. Um, traditional journal models, uh, basically charge the user, the uh, readers and libraries um, to have access to the content in their journals. So when open access came along, um, they wanted to, those open access journals wanted to make that content available for free to readers, um, which is great because we get all of this access to all of this research without having to pay anything, uh, which is a great thing if you're a library with a dwindling, dwindling budget, but it also, um, meant that the journals had to make money somehow. So they started charging authors in order to publish. Um, so authors started having to pay author publishing fees. Um, and that really opened the door for these predatory journals to kind of prey on authors who needed to be published. Um, so Jeffrey Beal, who is a librarian at the University of Colorado, and until uh, January he ran a blacklist 
of predatory journals. He actually defines uh, predatory publishing as opportunistic because they prey on the um, they prey on the open access business model in order to make a profit. Um, they also exploit publishing needs. Um, they take advantage of scholarly authors who are under pressure to publish in order to be promoted and get tenure. And they especially prey on young researchers who are unfamiliar with the publishing process and don't really know any better. Um, and they often copy the look and feel of legitimate publisher websites. So you might go to a publisher website and it may seem very, very legitimate when in fact it's a predatory or a fake journal. Um, and they actually have no interest in legitimate research. Uh, their interest is just basically to make money, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, they are much more interested in, in making money and getting authors to submit articles than they are in actually producing le legitimate research. Um, and because of that, they actually don't have much of a peer review process at all. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So a lot of people don't actually realize when they're submitting to predatory journals because these uh, journals can be really good at fooling people. Um, and if you, a lot of people don't realize that they don't actually archive their work. So if you submit to a predatory journal and it gets accepted, your article could be published on their website and then all of a sudden just disappear and it's nowhere to be found again. So. Um, that's a big problem. And once you've already uh, published on, with a predatory journal, since your literature has technically already been published, you can't publish that work elsewhere. So you cannot disseminate your, your research um, anymore after it's already been published. So it really leaves the researchers hand tied to uh, get their work out there. Okay, so the goal of predatory publishing is to make lots and lots of money. And the way they do this is they really uh, try and get as many authors to submit their works as they can because the more authors that, that they get to submit work and they accept their work, the more author fees that they can charge. So um, they send out a lot of spam emails trying to convince you that their journal is good article or a good journal for you to submit your article to. Um, and a lot of these spam emails are very poorly written. We have an example of one of those coming up. Um, and it really, unfortunately, the, the open access model has really created a negative incentive for, for publishers. Um, the incentive becomes making money, not publishing research. Um, okay. Any questions so far? So I'm blind, excuse my glasses. Um, so as I said, my main experience with predatory publishing has been a little bit more in the mentor side of things than um, having a personal experience. And I've actually, um, since Ruth and I have been talking, was thinking about why, why is that? And I think the answer is because I'm old. Um, and that before, like half of you were born, in 1993, when I was um, starting out in um, my work in mentoring faculty and research, you know, there were just a finite number of journals, and I'd heard of them all, right? You know, JAMA, New England Journal, even, you know, I was in family medicine, so um, American Academy of Family Physicians or Journal of Family Medicine, right? They're all completely legitimate, right? And you could work with them, and you could get really great information from them um, about how to publish. And it was so, you know, we were so naive back in those days about what, what it could be. Um, and so actually, I teach the evidence-based medicine and research methods course to the PA students here, and we struggle a lot with that. And I went to our faculty meeting one day and I said, how do you, how do you know what's a legit journal and what's not? And the faculty said, they quoted the famous Supreme Court, right, you know it when you see it. And they do because they're old like me, and they remember the list of journals that were legitimate at the time. Um, but our students walking into that today have no idea. And um, bringing it back around to faculty, um, certainly PA faculty, um, but also um, faculty in other clinical disciplines such as medicine, occupational therapy, speech, nursing, things like that, don't typically have extensive research training as part of their um, basic training for their pr profession. 
and they find that they like teaching and somebody hires them to become a faculty member and says publish and they have no context for how to do that and that is I think the group that is most vulnerable to this predatory publishing phenomenon so um, I have a colleague at a different university that I used to work at he was so flattered he got this wonderful email dear dr. X you're so eminent you're so well loved you're handsome and tall publish with us right and um, so he it turned out they had actually read a, a legitimate article that he had published in a legitimate journal right got his name and email off the bottom of that and um, sent him this request well, he had, was, even though had published something, was still a novice um, author and uh, was totally taken by um, this description of his eminence. And um, he submitted a manuscript to them. And um, he was so happy because they didn't require any changes at all in the whole peer review process. Isn't this amazing? My article is so great. And then he gets an email that says, pay the $3,000 or you're done. And he came to out to our offices and was just crushed. Had no idea that this was in the cards, unfortunately. Um, so, um, of course, this comes from the faculty pressure um, to publish, right? Whatever metric you assess faculty based on, that's what you're going to incentivize. Um, and particularly if there's no assessment of if it's done well, you're simply going to incentivize numbers. The predatory um, publishing movement takes advantage of that um, pressure. And you know, actually, if you think about it, if the publishing fee is $3,000, maybe a faculty member would not consider that too much to save their job, right? Um, you know, if you've got mortgage and kids and you know, whatever, $3,000 might sound actually like a bargain in the end. Um, uh, I was talking with a colleague of mine who's the editor of a section of a legitimate journal um, after Ruth and I started making this um, talk. And uh, as, literally as we were sitting next to each other at a conference, something popped into my, his email and he just turned his computer to show it to me. And it said, dear Dr. So-and-so, um, my dean has told me I need to publish X number of papers in the next six months or I'm in trouble, can you, can your journal publish something in six months? And he's like, well, since you haven't started IRB, probably not. Um, but that, um, that process can sneak up on people, particularly if they're on the tenure track. They don't think about, well, I have my seven years, I better make sure that in like year two and three I'm publishing to allow that pipeline, the publishing pipeline to happen. Um, so, sorry, I've just gotta turn my pages here. Um, oh, you know, it's interesting because these journals are sensitive to a certain extent to the fact that they don't have a good reputation. And so, you know, actually the email that Ruth got this morning and the emails that I get, which we have some of them in here, it's pretty amusing, um, that I get literally daily are actually trying to trade on both the good name of George Washington University School of Medicine, right? But also, I, I would hope, the reasonable name that I've established with my publications in the literature. And when you're published a little bit more, you start getting requests to be on the editorial board, which is really, really uh, them trying to capitalize on the name of a respected medical school and a reasonably respected, hopefully, researcher. Um, I get an email every single day from a journal called EC Ophthalmology, okay? Everyone who practices medicine has something that grosses them out. I practiced emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins for seven years. I have a cast iron stomach, but I will tell you the one thing I can't cope with is eyes. And so I think it's completely amusing that having never published in an ophthalmologic journal, I get daily requests from this journal to submit a manuscript to them. Um, so I think that's about it for me at the moment. So I'll let Ruth back on. All right. So next, we actually have a sample email. Oh, no, from the ophthalmology. Yeah, this is, this is the exact <laughs> journal that she gets every single day. Um, and I just kind of highlighted some of the things that I thought were uh, sort of entertaining in, in red, bold font. You have the subject line, precious publication. In my opinion, Journal articles should be scholarly, not precious. <laughs> Kittens are precious. Babies are precious, not scholarly journal articles. So this to me was like immediate red flag before you even open the email when you see that subject line that your, your signal should be going off saying something fishy here. 
Um, uh, we hope you had a great time on the eve of New Year 2017. First of all, I thought that was very, very overly personal for, you know, theoretically your first time interacting with, with this person. And most of us call it New Year's Eve, not Eve of the New Year. So um, next one, I am very much pleased to kindly notify you that, I mean, that's really ridiculously wordy. How many of us actually talk like that? Um, let's see. The association uh we want to yeah experienced personalities like you well you know all of us are experienced personalities just by existing <laughs> so I, I what does that even mean i don't i have no idea um and your contribution towards the research field is absolutely prominent so they don't even really specify which research field first of all and by saying oh you're you have this prominent you know, reputation that's totally trying to play on her ego. And, you know, they want her to think, yeah, I do. These guys recognize it. They get me. I should publish with them. So, um, and let's see. I would be glad to have your active participation in the journal activities, normally known as publishing. <laughs> Why do they call it journal activities? That one just cracked me up. Um, and again, they are glad to welcome her precious article. It's so precious. And so that just bugs me. I don't know bugs me. Um, so kindly let us know at your convenience to submit. That, the wording there I just thought was weird. So um, I don't know. Did you have any other no, thoughts? I mean, a lot of these are not really written by anyone else either. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you get. Yeah. And this is actually one of the better ones that I've seen. I've seen a lot that are just misspellings, grammatical errors that a publishing company should never make. I mean, it looks, some of them literally look like a 12 year old non-English speaker wrote it. So, um, so if you read something that just doesn't quite make sense or you see some red flags, just don't respond. Okay, so speaking of red flags, um, I have two different slides where I'm going to talk about some different red flags to watch for. I have eight in total, but there are plenty more. I could have gone on for two hours about different red flags to watch for. And um, my slides managed to be a little bit off on this one. Sorry about that. But, okay, so the first red flag is unsolicited emails, like we just talked about. So if you didn't actually go to the journal and say, hey, I'm interested in submitting, can you give me some more information? If you're just getting emails from publishers that you've never heard of, that you have never said, hey, I would like some more information, that's kind of a red flag right off the bat. Um, but a lot of times these unsolicited emails come pretty soon after you've actually published something else in a legitimate journal. So they're looking at, at other journals and seeing when people publish and say, oh, this person is interested in publishing, they've just published, let's send them an email and see if they're interested in publishing with us. Um, so you always want to question why did the publisher send you an email? Was there ill intent involved? Are they just trying to make a buck? Um, are they asking you to write about something you don't study? If you're a cardiologist and they're asking you to write an article about, uh, I don't know, gynecology or something like that, it's probably not something that's legitimate. Um, does the language make sense? Is it filled with spelling and grammatical errors? Is it really awkward and unprofessional or just hard to follow? Um, do they use flattery to appeal to your ego? Are you an esteemed colleague or esteemed uh, scholar? Um, if they, a lot of times they want you to, they want you to think that they think extremely highly of you and really they know nothing about you other than that you've published. Um, and who is the invitation to publish sent from? Uh, most of the time it should be sent from the actual editor uh, of a journal, and a lot of times it, these predatory journals just send it from, you know, could be a random staff member. Um, and if it's sent from an editor, do they actually give you their credentials? Does it, is it signed by, you know, Jane Doe, PhD, or MD? Um, and are those credentials actually real? Just do a simple Google search, uh, see if you can find any information about it. A lot of times, they're just made up credentials. So, um, and do you recognize the name? Is it a prominent person within the field who's sending you the email? Um, and the second one is suspicious journal titles. Um, a lot of journals, 
like to use the ter terms like institute, uh, academy, or association in their title just to add some brand value when really they have no association with any institute, academy, or association. Um, a lot of times they will make journal titles that are very, very similar to legitimate prominent journals. Uh, so you should always make sure that it's actually the journal that you're thinking of instead of this one that's really, really similar. Um, and a lot of times they include misleading information in the title. A lot of times it's misleading geographic information. Um, so there's actually one journal, that, a predatory journal, that has the title American-Based Research Journal. And I went on their website and went on the Contact Us page of their website, and it's actually based in Manchester, England. But they're using the word American. So, or they're claiming to be based in Manchester, England. They could be based in China or India or someplace like that. So um, third one is take a look at their website. Is it an amateur looking website? A lot of these journals are actually getting pretty savvy and their websites can look pretty legitimate, but a lot of them still have amateur websites where they just have you know typos everywhere. I saw one journal that when they were talking about their open access policy, they said that they were a non-profitable journal instead of non-profit. <laughs> and I thought, huh, I don't know that you want to publicize that. But, um, you know, it was a simple grammatical error, spelling error that made them look really, really bad. <laughs> so, um, let's see, are there advertisements on the site? You know, some legitimate journals do have a few advertisements, but a lot of the predatory ones are just advertising ridiculous things just to make a buck. Um, and does their website include an about us type of page? And a lot of them do, but they don't have very much information on that page. Uh, so you really wanna look at not only if they have that type of page, but what is there? Is it enough information for you? Um, are the aim and scope of the journal actually legitimate? A lot of the journals um, have a, a scope that is really too broad for what they should have. Um, the, faculty member who sent me an email asking about a journal this morning, it was, let's see, a journal about midwifery, women's studies, and just nursing studies in general. And I thought, that's a really broad scope. How are they going to, you know, they, they basically just want to accept everything under those three categories and call it a day. Um, and the reason they do that is because the broader they make their scope, the more articles they can they can accept and the more money they can make through those author fees. So, um, and one more thing about their website, is there actually information about the peer review process on the website? A lot of them um, have some information, but a lot of it is completely bogus. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about peer review on the next slide, but um, you wanna make sure that they actually have some sort of indication that, that there's peer review uh, going on. Uh, and do they actually have instructions for authors? Uh, the email I got this morning, that journal had, their instructions for authors were basically like, submit an article in Word. And that was pretty much it. So, um, okay, lastly on this slide, look for contact information on their website. If they do not have any contact information listed, that is a huge red flag. Um, a lot of times they'll have uh, just a web form you'll click on, click on contact us and it'll literally just open up with a web form and they want you to fill that out and it'll go to some mysterious location and you have no idea where it is and you don't know who you're contacting, what their position is, so that's a red flag. Um, but even if they have a physical address, that's not always enough. Um, I normally will do a Google Maps search for that address and see what, uh, I normally click on Street View and see what it actually looks like. I had one journal one time that the physical address came up to be a bank. I doubt, and this, this particular company published like 200 journals. I doubt that they're operating out of a bank building. Um, I had another one that looked like this dingy old house in some rundown neighborhood in an inner city somewhere. And I thought, mm, no, probably not. <laughs> probably not a legitimate publishing company. Um, do, do they have phone numbers listed? Do they have email addresses listed? All of that you should be looking for. Um, and all of this does actually take some time to look into, but normally you can tell within the first five to 10 minutes whether or not it's gonna be a predatory journal, so. 
Okay, more red flags. Um, take a look at the editorial board. First of all, do they actually list who is on the editorial board? Um, I looked at a journal once who was asking a faculty member to be on the editorial board and their editorial board link on the website was completely dead. It didn't take me anywhere. So I assumed they don't have any editors. Um, and then I went back uh, just within the last two weeks and they have a lot of editors listed, but they have, you know, these nice little pictures next to everyone's name, but it was obvious that they just took the pictures off of some website somewhere and just slapped them on there. They were all smushed and, you know, not, not good resolution. Um, so look at the editorial board, see if you actually recognize anyone um, on there, see if there are any prominent names who are on there, and then I would take it a step further and actually do a Google search for those people and see if the people who are they're claiming to be on the editorial board are actually claiming that journal. So look at their LinkedIn profiles, look at their or ORCID um, profiles, look at the uh, faculty profiles that they have from whatever university they're associated with and see if they ever claim to be on the editorial board of that journal. Um, a lot of these have very unclear author fees. Uh, so sometimes the the policies are actually easy to find on the website. Most often they're not. Um, I had one journal that uh, when I first looked at it for a faculty member maybe three or four months ago, it said that the author fee was $4,000. I went back last week when Tammy and I met and it was down to $200 that they were claiming. And then I went back just this past Monday and they didn't have a fee listed at all. So there's obviously a clear lack of transparency there. Author fees should always be clear and you should know what you're getting into before you submit that article. If you get an invoice for $4,000, that should not be a surprise when you get that invoice. Um, and I also would compare how their author fees um, compare to other reputable journals within that same field. Are they charging $4,000 when most reputable journals in that field are only charging you know, $500 or however much? So um, I would always compare it to a journal you know is reputable. Um, probably one of the biggest red flags that I always look for are promises of rapid or quick or speedy peer review. Uh, peer review takes, legitimate good peer review actually takes quite a bit of time. Um, and you can't, you know, submit an article and have it published within three or four weeks. That just doesn't happen in normal peer review uh, schedules. So, um, Unfortunately, peer review is one of the hardest things to actually examine because a lot of it is so blinded within the institution. Um, but the good thing is that we can actually examine the result of the peer review. You can look at the published articles and see if they actually look like something that has gone through legitimate peer review. Um, so let's see, honest peer review often results in papers being rejected which goes against the predatory publishing business model of making as much money as they can. If they reject papers, that means that they're not going to get that author fee. That $4,000 is going away. So most of the time, they don't reject papers ever. Um, so an easy way to, to figure out whether or not they actually follow some sort of peer review process is just to look at the articles that they've already published. Do they seem legitimate? Do they seem to be based on sound science? Does it seem like something that would have passed a, a good peer review process with a legitimate journal? Um, and a lot of times there will be articles published by the same author, either within a single issue or the same author will always have an article published in every single issue. So that can be a red flag too. And finally, fake metrics are a red flag. A lot of journals just make up some mysterious metric system, and they say, oh, our journal has, you know, a whatever impact factor of 7.86, and then you realize, well, that's kind of a bogus, they just made up that, that impact factor. So I always double check um, to make sure that it's actually a real metric that they're using. I always look at, uh, I always look at the Insights Journal Citation Reports. If they're listing an impact factor, I check there to make sure that it's actually a real impact factor. Um, and I try and find out if other journals actually use the, those same metrics, if it's something I've never heard of. Okay, did you have anything to add to that, Tim? 
I would just say that, you know, the, I'll come up with some premise for your point. I guess I would, the only thing I would say about um, back, sort of one slide back about solicitation is that certainly legitimate author, or legitimate journals do solicit manuscripts, for particularly for either theme articles or for like the 20th anniversary of the professional association, that kind of thing. But then they come from people you know in your field and they, they give you a specific thing. You're our expert on X, Y, or Z, and you've already published on that a lot, and we would like you to make a contribution. So there are some um, legit solicitations, but they're small in number compared to the illegitimate ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah some legitimate journals do um, charge page fees. I know that Journal of Infectious Diseases started charging page fees in like 97 or 98, um, so, they, so some of them do. Um, still, um, BMJ actually has a policy, the whole BMJ and the whole BMJ group have a policy that I really think is wonderful and extremely fair. They have a policy that basically if the um, research that you're publishing um, came from a grant over a certain number of dollars, or well, pounds, right, so maybe 20,000 pounds or something, then you have to pay a fee to have it published. But if you're just a really great junior researcher that came up with a novel idea, maybe was doing it in their postdoc or something, and you don't have a funding source, then it's actually free. And I think that's a really nice way to, um, you know, for them to um, take advantage appropriately of the folks that have good funding, but to allow opportunities for junior researchers to um, get their work published. Okay. So here are just two examples of some uh, predatory medical journals that I've run across over the last year or so. Um, the first one is called the Journal of Nursing Sciences, and actually uh, Tammy found this on their website when we were looking at it. And literally, they had this image um, right underneath uh, where they had the title of the journal, and the title above this said Journal of Nursing Science, and then this image says Journal of Nursing Sciences. So they couldn't even get it straight on their own website, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, this particular journal sent a faculty member an extremely poorly written email. It was very obvious that this was not sent from a native English speaker. It had a lot of grammatical errors. It tried to use flattery to convince the member to join the editorial board. Uh, it was ve a very difficult to follow email. Um, and it was very, very unprofessional. The email lacked links to the journal's website, which to me kind of made me think that the journal didn't actually want the faculty member to investigate the journal and check it out for themselves. Um, I would think a legitimate journal, if they're asking you to, to publish with them, would say, oh, by the way, check us out. Here's a link to our website. We, we're really cool, and we want you to publish with us, so come check us out. To me, it seemed like they were just hiding the fact that they were bad by not including that. So you had to actually go search uh, to find their website. Um, and the publisher was once listed on uh, Jeffrey Beale's blacklist of predatory journals. Um, that has since gone away. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really the end-all, be-all um, list, but typically if a, if a journal was list or a publisher was listed on that site, it was not a very good sign. Um, and this publisher was listed on that sign at some point. Um, this is actually the journal when I did the Google Maps search. This is the one that came up as a bank when I went to Street View. So, and this publisher had, I believe it was at least 200 uh, different journals that they claimed to publish. Um, the journal didn't have an ISSN. Um, when I initially investigated the journal, this was the one that didn't have any members listed on the editorial board, and then later they had the, the list, but it was, you know, bad, um, bad pictures, and I couldn't find any evidence that people who were actually listed on the editorial boards were claiming to be on those editorial boards. Um, so a lot of times what they will do is they'll send an email saying, hey, would you like to be on our editorial board? And even if you respond and say no, they'll put you on there anyways. So um, it's always a good idea to double check, um, go back in the future and make sure that they did not use your name um, without permission. And it's really, really difficult to get off of those 
editorial boards once they once they put you on there. Um, and again, this is the one that initially was charging four thousand dollars for an author fee, went down to two hundred, and now there's no information at all. Um, the journal was not listed on Allred's web or journal citation reports, so there's no uh, impact factor information. Um, I couldn't find any information about where the journal was indexed. Um, and they actually did not, when I did the initial investigation three or four months ago, they didn't have a single journal article posted on their website, and they still don't today. So um, it was kind of a red flag. Um, the second one is the Journal of Neurology and Stroke, um, and this is published by the MedCrave Group, um, which is actually a uh, publisher based out of India. And about a year and a half ago, they had 80, about 87 journals to their name, and as of, uh, I think, Monday, they had 135. So they have really tried to expand expand their their domain, I guess, and make even more money by almost doubling their the amount of journals that they have. Um, and they have a history of spamming uh, faculty members during open access week. And they'll just send out blast emails saying, happy open access week, we're an open access journal, come publish with us. Um, so be aware of that. They solicit authors to publish outside of their academic field. Um, they once uh, solicited uh, Jeffrey Beal, who is an academic librarian, to publish in a journal titled the International Journal of Avian, Avian and Wildlife Biology. He probably, ha he's a librarian, he has zero expertise as far as I know about birds or wildlife biology, so why is he going to publish in that journal? Um, they didn't have any contact information listed on their website. They did sort of have an address, but the address only had a street name a city and a zip code. It didn't have an actual street number associated with that. Um, and they're, let's see, they claim to operate out of Edmond, Oklahoma, but in all likelihood, they're probably operating out of India somewhere. Um, their telephone number that they listed has a 918 area code, but when I look that up, that is actually a Tulsa area code, not an Edmond, Oklahoma area code. So um, you kind of have to be a little bit like Sherlock Holmes with this and just be patient and do the research. Um, and one thing I thought was a little bit entertaining on their website, instead of having a contact us page, they had a connect us page, but that one went straight to a web form. So, um, and they claimed that they were indexed in the directory of open access journals, DOAJ, but when I actually went to DOAJ's website and did a search for this journal, I came up completely empty. They're not indexed in there at all. So they may claim to be indexed in all of these places that you know, um, but just do your do your homework, double check, because a lot of times they're not indexed there at all. So, okay. So next, what to do if you are approached by a questionable journal? Do you want to chime in on this too, Sammy, or do you? You start. Okay. Okay. So, um, the first thing I would say is just to do your homework. Take a look um, at all of, the, all of the things we just talked about. See if you see any red flags. If you do, that should probably um, tell you that there's something fishy going on. Um, so to look at the journal's website. Does it feel legit? Um, who's on the editorial board? And feel free to contact uh, the people who are listed on the editorial board and also authors. Feel free to find their contact information, give them a call, send them an email, ask them about their experience with that journal. You may find out that you talk to someone who is listed on the editorial board and you call them and, and you say, hey, I see you're on the editorial board for journal X, Y, and Z. They'll say, no, I'm not. That's a red flag. So um, if it, I don't want to go back to the you know it when you see it thing, but after you get some experience of knowing what to look for, it's sort of true, but you have to know what to look for in order to, to get that. So um, I would also uh, talk to your librarians. I know this might seem like a shameless plug, but go talk to the librarians. Librarians know what journals are legitimate and what journals have been around forever. And if they don't, they will help you do the research to figure out if, if it's a good journal or not. I probably get um, 
I guess it depends on time of the year, but I, I can get up to, you know, two or three emails about uh, predatory publishing a week from faculty members asking for my input. It's not always that many, but um, we are happy to look into it and try and help you figure it out. Um, and then I, maybe Tammy can talk about this more, but I would talk to your faculty mentors and talk to people in your department who are familiar with things in that specific field. And they, they're going to be a good, a good resource for you. I, I agree with everything Ruth said. I, I will say, even before I investigate, it's not my field, I just delete. And, um, you know, good email hygiene is not to give these people any satisfaction, right? So not to even give them your, like I'm always afraid if I reply and my signature file is in there, they'll go and put me on their editorial board or their author list or something. So I don't even want them to have that. I mean, it's readily available on the internet. So if they really want it, they can get it, but don't wait and want to give them the satisfaction. Um, and I heartily agree. I'm on the editorial board of one of our two main professional journals, and I am delighted to speak with any potential author at any potential time. I have nothing to hide, and I'm, I want to encourage good scholarship in my field. And so I'm happy to help facilitate that, and particularly to be an encouragement to junior authors. So don't feel like you're, I mean, I suppose if it's New England Journal, maybe you might have a quick think, but um, for, for many journals, I think the editorial board um, is absolutely willing to help answer those questions. And then usually every journal has a managing editor who's kind of the day-to-day -day person at the publishing, at the publisher, who also can say, oh, you know, you're like, my manuscript is 2,600 words, but it's 2,600 words for this really important reason. I know your limit is 2,500 words. They can advise you on things like that um, as well. And, and anybody who's legitimate is not going to have a beef with you calling or emailing about those things. Okay. And then on this slide, we just have a list of um, some available resources um, that will kind of help you figure out if something is legitimate or not. Um, and we will make the slides available. All of these are hyperlinked, so you should be able just to click on the slide and go straight to it. But I'll give you a quick overview of each of them. Um, so Himmelfarb actually has a scholarly publishing research guide that has a predatory publishing tab on that research guide that gives you a lot of the same red flags that we talked about, but it gives you additional red flags to look for. Um, it gives you just a lot of general information um, about predatory publishing and what to watch out for, and it gives you more resources than are on this slide to, to look at, too. So, um, and the next one is a website called Think, Check, Submit, and this is actually a campaign that helps researchers identify trusted journals, and they actually have a really good um, simple checklist to help you figure out if a journal is legitimate or not. Um, and then there's Insights Journal Citation Reports, and this is where I go to double check if the impact factor that a journal is claiming to have is actually a real impact factor. A lot of times I'll look up journals that claim to have an impact factor of, you know, 2.5, and they're not even listed on journal citation reports at all. So. Um, Web is uh, a good place to go to search for some detailed information about journals. They uh, list pretty much all the information you would ever want to know about a journal. They have the ISSN number, who publishes it, um, the abstracting and indexing coverage. Um, and normally when I'm looking for to see if something is predatory or not, I look at where where is that journal indexed. If it's indexed in some legitimate databases like, like Scopus or places like that, then it's probably hopefully going to be okay. Sometimes they'll say that it's actually indexed in PubMed, and unfortunately there have been a few predatory publishers that actually make it into PubMed. So, um, and I think that that's probably because a lot of people who get federal funding have to make things open access and then it's indexed in PubMed, and they actually are publishing the results of their federally funded research in predatory publishers. So PubMed, just because it's in PubMed, unfortunately doesn't always mean that it's a legitimate um, resource. Um, the Principles of Transparency and Best Practices in Scholarly Publishing is a mouthful, um, but it's a, it's a good place that, to go to look at the best practices for uh, journals and publishers. Um, and then you can kind of compare are, are these 
Journal is actually following these best practices. And then finally, Google Maps is my old standby. If I actually find an address, that's actually the, the part that I think is most fun because it's kind of like, huh, is this journal actually legitimate? Is this what I would expect that building to look like for a journal that, for a publisher that publishes 200 different journals? So. And that is it. Does anyone have any questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you had uh, met, uh, talked before about Jeffrey Gill's list, which mm -hmm. um, you know, can take it offline. Um, do you see anything coming up, and this might come from your experience talking to other librarians or um, talking to publishers, whatever the case may be, um, do you see anything popping up in response to that? Um, like, did you start something now? That I, the whole, yeah, so the question for, for those of you who couldn't hear because of the microphone is, is there a response to uh, Jeffrey Beal's list going offline and something to replace it? Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, the short answer is no, not really. <laughs> um, the whole, there's this whole mystery about why he, took the list down. Um, a lot of there, that happened in mid-January and there hasn't really been anything published about why. Um, and he has been very quiet about about why. Um, I think some some places have talked about trying to put up a whitelist or another blacklist, but I haven't heard of anything actually concrete coming down. So there's, that whole issue is still shrouded in mystery. <laughs> It sure would be nice if the it would sure be nice if the National Library of Medicine were to I mean I'm not a librarian have to be careful but would take this on because somebody who's basically indemnified right because I when I heard that I wondered right away if he had been sued mm -hmm. right and so it's really hard to sue the federal government and it's expensive and you know it seems like if, if somebody who just is hard to sue were to take it on and even if they took on a white list instead of yeah. a black list. Um, and then they would have also, you know, the, at least what I think is the outstanding credibility of the National Library of Medicine as well. But yeah, again, I'm not a librarian <laughs> and very clear about that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I wish there were like a simple one one place to go and check. Yep, it's on it's on this list. We're good to go. Um, but um, Jeffrey Beal actually had kind of a mixed reputation to begin with because he created this blacklist of, of potentially predatory journals, but some people said that he was very, very down on the whole open access movement in general. So there were a lot of legitimate open access journals that he would claim were not so good. So, um, but I think a lot of the things that he said about some journals were, were very, very valid. Any other questions? Any questions from WebEx folks? Actually, another one, and this might be more for Tammy. Um, as a, coming from the mentor perspective, mm -hmm. um, have you have, have you ever come across a situation where a faculty or a, a student did get sued by one of these publishers, and if so, did they have any recourse after handing over the money, or did they have any kind of way to make it right? No, there's no recourse, unfortunately. And what Ruth said really important, which is they can put put your article up for a day and then take it down and it's been published, right? And any then if you wanted to submit it to something legit, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to. Although I will say I would have a lot less guilt about salami slicing my data. You guys know that term about publishing a lot off the same little data set. I'd have a lot less guilt about potentially tweaking it just a little bit and submitting it to something legitimate if I had accidentally been um, rung over by one of these journals because you can say it's been published, but if it's not accessible to anybody, does that mean it's actually been published? And I would potentially have a discussion, a frank discussion with the managing editor um, because honesty is in fact always the best policy. You don't want them to come back to you later on. But if you say, look, this happened to me, I think this is prevalent enough at this point that people actually realize that that can happen um, and are sympathetic to legitimate people who got caught up in it. So, um, yeah, I was gonna, there was one other thing I was gonna say, I, I apologize. Uh, oh, I guess I would just say that, you know, from a mentorship perspective as well, if 
people are listening to our mentors, you know, this is actually, it's a great opportunity when you start talking with somebody about their project to help them think about their target journal from day one. Um, and that, you know, you really write toward your target journal. You write toward that audience in your head. You think about, you know, how many figures and tables can I have? What color do they do or not do? How many words? Um, how does it fit into the ongoing conversation that's happening within that journal? And do I add something to that conversation? And I think hopefully when we do mentor um, students and junior faculty, we, if we train them to enter into that discussion right away, um, even, you know, as soon as the research design phase, um, I think that we're doing them a long-term service then. Any other questions? Can I just say one, like, one little extra thing? I, I have to go back and find, so, you know, in a room of librarians, I probably shouldn't say it, but I have to find the citation. But um, I actually read an article in Washington Post, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, I'm not exactly sure, but somewhere in a reasonable newspaper online about an a engineering professor that wrote an entire, have you heard, heard about this, who wrote an entire um, article from the um, autocomplete function of his iPhone, okay, and submitted it to a um, open access predatory journal in the engineering discipline and had it accepted. He's like, it was gibberish. I just literally poked like the next word on the left each time and then would put in a period and, you know, feed it with a couple of words at the beginning, you know, the stress test showed and then just started hitting autocomplete. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the science sting from 2013. That's a resource I always recommend. So. And actually, when Tammy and I met last week to to kind of talk about what we were going to uh, cover on this on this talk, she told me that on one of the editorial boards that she's on, um, they actually she was a reviewer for an article that got rejected, and they gave the author a bunch of suggestions on how to make it better and submit it to a different journal. And then she was randomly doing a Google search for something unrelated, and this journal article that she had rejected came up. And it had been published un completely unchanged in a predatory journal. They didn't take any of their suggestions to improve it at all. So um, unfortunately, I think a lot of authors who get rejected from legitimate journals go straight to the predatory journals because it makes them feel better. So. Thanks, you guys. You've been really attentive. Yeah. <laughs> so.